Welcome, everyone, to the 250th anniversary of Francis Asbury's arrival in the British colonies. Asbury left his home, his family, his loved ones to travel to a world unknown to him, all in order to follow a call of God. Today, we honor and celebrate that call. And we'll begin with words of welcome from Reverend Mark Savatzion. Thank you, Dr. Bogendreff. Welcome, everyone, to Historic St. George's United Methodist Church on this festive occasion. Thank you all for coming. I uh, want to welcome everyone to come back for our worship service tomorrow, which uh, will be a wonderful worship service provided, uh, presided over by uh, our bishops. And finally, I just want to thank the committee who are, are organized this event for the last five or six months. Pastor Fred Day, formerly of the General Commission on Archives and History, Dr. Bob Williams, Dr. Bogan Dreff, and all of the members of the committee who put on this event in England about eight weeks ago and culminating in today's, uh, today's two-day uh, festival of Francis Asbury. We're so excited to have John Wigger as our keynote speaker today. John is the author of American Saint, the seminal biography of Francis Asbury. And I'm a Francis Asbury geek, so I was able to get John's autograph on my copy of his great book. One, uh, 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 one exciting thing about, about this book is you learn that when Francis Asbury was young, his mother called him Frankie, which I think personalizes Francis Asbury for us as a real human and as a real Methodist. Thank you all for coming today. I'm going to hand it back to Dr. Bogan Dreff for our program. Please enjoy, and please enjoy our refreshments. Thank you all for coming. God bless. So I bring greetings from the General Commission on Archives and History. Welcome again to this historic event. We are so appreciative of your being here and of the work that went into, the, into organizing this gathering over the next two days and over the past two months. Those gathered here and those who organized this event showcase that very heart of the Methodist connection that Asbury helped to lay upon his arrival. Representing the General Commission on Archives and History, we have our staff here, uh, Michelle merkel Buntgrill, uh, Francis Lyons, Mark Shinnais, and Jay Rollins, as well as Bishop Scholl. Uh, we also have a few uh, former commissioners here and current commissioners here, so welcome to you all. And we have some former staffers as well. Chris Anderson, our former Methodist librarian, is present. And behind me on the altar are flowers in memory and honor of Reverend Dr. Kenneth Rao, who died a couple of weeks ago, but was the former Methodist librarian and a renowned Methodist historian. So on behalf of the General Commission on Archives and History, welcome. In reflecting on his voyage, Asbury penned in his journal, Whither am I going to the new world? What to do? To gain honor? No. If I know my own heart, to get money? No. I am going to live to God and bring others so to do. Twenty-six years old, never to return to his home of his birth, Francis Asbury follows his call to live to God and bring others so to do. Friends, we pray that the festivities of today and the worship of tomorrow will renew your own spirit, your passion to live to God and bring others so to do. We want to welcome our special guest today, and if you will stand or wave as I introduce you this afternoon, we welcome Bishop Scholl, Bishop of Greater New Jersey and Eastern Pennsylvania Conferences, and Beverly Scholl this day. <laughs> Bishop Scholl will be preaching tomorrow at 10 a.m. and invites you back for that worship service. We welcome Bishop Bickerton and Sally Bickerton, who are with us this afternoon. We give thanks. <laughs> Bishop Harvey, who is called to the business of her annual conference, sends greetings. 
We give thanks for Dr. Ashley bogan Dreff and her team, and we give thanks for her leadership of this event today. We welcome Dan Krauss of United Methodist Communications. Welcome, Dan. We welcome the extended cabinets of Greater New Jersey and Eastern Pennsylvania Conferences. We are glad you are here. And we want to give thanks. If there are any historic St. George's members or friends this day, will you stand that we can honor you and thank you for your hospitality. This day, Reverend Ivan G. Corbin, President of the Historical Society of the United Methodist Church, sends his greetings. He says, I send you greetings on behalf of the Historical Society of the United Methodist Church. I wish I was able to be in two places at once, as this recognition and remembrance of Asbury's one and only crossing to the colonies 250 years ago literally changed the religious trajectory of these colonies and soon to be fledgling nation. We who are part of the various streams of American Wesleyan expression are direct beneficiaries of the tireless mission and ministry of Francis Asbury and it is only fitting that this anniversary be recognized and celebrated. Have a wonderful gathering and remember and celebrate well. And this day I bring you final greetings by the Reverend Ruth M. Gee uh, from the President of the Methodist Conference. We give thanks from the Methodist Church in Britain and hear these words. Sisters and brothers in Christ, thank you for this opportunity to bring greetings from the Methodist people in Britain. As we celebrate the 250th anniversary of Francis Asbury's response to God's call, focusing this weekend on his landing in America. I am very sorry not to be able to be with you in person as I had hoped to be, but I am looking forward to watching the recording of the events in Philadelphia. As I have read and learned about Francis Asbury, many things have impressed me, among them his courage and resilience, his dedication to a life of mission and service, his commitment to mission on the frontier in rural areas, and his determination to retain the focus on those things he identified as essential aspects of Methodism. All these are part of his legacy, and I think there is another important lesson we can learn from Francis Asbury, the importance of what I shall call incarnational mission. Francis Asbury recognized that it was neither possible nor desirable simply to import British Methodism to America as others had tried to do. This man from the industrial Midlands of England adjusted to a very different context and learned what it was to live as an American. He took time to learn and understand a very different way of life and culture. And because of this, was able to establish the Methodist way of life in this new context. Asbury had left a legacy in America, and more widely, I believe he also left a legacy for the ongoing relationship between the United Methodist Church and the Methodist Church in Britain. As we share together and learn from one another in our concordat, we need always to be aware that our contexts are different, and we cannot simply transcribe from one to another. Our mission is and must be incarnational. However, like Asbury, we can continue to identify those concerns we hold in common and on which we can work together. We can help one another to be true to our common Methodist heritage and to our calling to take God's love to all, meeting people where they are. I have loved being a part of the group, developing the concordat between us. I have been enriched, enthused, and challenged by friends in the United Methodist Church, and I have been enriched, enthused, and challenged by my encounter with Francis Asbury. We may not be with you in person, but be assured that your sisters and brothers in the Methodist Church in Britain will be praying and celebrating with you as you meet in Philadelphia. Please join me for a time of prayer printed in your bulletin. 
Almighty God, in a time of great need, you raised up servants like Francis Asbury, and by your Spirit inspired them to kindle flames of sacred love, which leaped across oceans, transversed cities, and countryside in an inextinguishable blaze. Grant that those whose hearts have been ignited will be refreshed and renewed in remembering them. May the legacy they bequeath to us stoke an increased spiritual holiness throughout the land, so that facing the frontiers of our day, we will faithfully live unto God and invite others to do so, doing your will as fully and effectively on earth as it is in heaven. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Good day, brothers and sisters. Good day, brothers and sisters. Good day. Thank you. Oh, it warms my heart to be here amongst you today, in Philadelphia, where my labors in America began. Oh, I preached my very first sermon here, in this very building, on a floor much less pleasant than this. It was dirt, for those of you unfamiliar. But it is uh, good to be here. Oh, I must say, uh, for those of my brothers and sisters uh, who are observing us from England, I must offer my sympathies because, well, as it has become apparent, after my years of laboring in the vineyards of America, I have harvested an American accent. <laughs> but so much is here. I have loved and do love America. So much is familiar to my eyes, but much more to my heart. Although my heart is still saddened to see that some of the men of this uh, room have succumbed to the fashions of the day by wearing full-length trousers. I would not have acknowledged such men wearing these things, much less permitted them to preach. Of course, it is not my duty to preach today, which may prove a comfort to some of you. <laughs> uh, in truth, was not always everyone's favorite. Uh, when I was bishop, I was traveling to a town about 40 miles from here. I had been asked to preach, and unfortunately I was not feeling well, as was often the case. And so I asked my traveling companion, Jesse Lee, to preach in my stead. I exhorted briefly after him. The response was clear. The bishop's sermon was magnificent. The old man who spoke after him was not very good. Yet this is not what gathers us here together together. No. We are here upon what I understand to be a rather momentous anniversary of my arrival here in America. <laughs> I have been asked to speak upon my journey and to, well, to touch on such points. Since I am not preaching, instead of using the holy book, I shall borrow from my own journal, which I do not wish to be seen as gospel. As I heard some of them before, some of the words will be familiar to you. This was written in the, the year 1771, on the 12th day of September, not long after my beginning of my journey to the New World. I will set down a few things that lie on my mind. Whither am I going? Well, to best understand that, it is best to understand from whence I came. And in truth, I was born in uncertainty to a man of the field and a woman very much of the world. I was born on the 20th of August, or perhaps the 21st. There was no family Bible to transcribe such records upon. The evidence of my baptism is all but forgotten. Yet I can testify to my mother's faith. Oh, yes. Years after the loss of our, my sister Sarah, she began to take comfort in the Bible. I found it strange as a child to see my mother huddled over one book by the window for hours all together. She tried to impart its power to me, and I was able to read its verses by age seven. However, as a child, I understood as a child. I thought as a child. However, as her desire continued to gain more faith, she well, we began to attend services at Great Bar, but in addition to that, my, with my father's permission, my mother began to welcome 
everyone who had the appearance of religion into our home. Many of them Methodists, so they could hold meetings. And this did very little for me. In truth, I wanted very little to do with the Methodists. The more rough and vile children who learned of this began to call me the Methodist parson. I did not understand the insult at first. However, I knew that it must have been something very bad because the Methodists once beloved, they now were much reviled in counties throughout England. Many, if not all, recalled the occasions of the attacks in Wensbury. When the Methodists were attacked, brutally beaten, windows and walls destroyed, the name Methodist, their only crime. So you can understand my disinterest in being considered as Methodist. It was not long before my apprenticeship began as a metal worker that I was uh, introduced to a traveling shoemaker. My mother invited him in to exhort, of course. And during his exhortation, I was convinced that there was some great thing more in religion than I had ever understood before. Unfortunately, the shoemaker was also a Baptist, but we shall not hold that against him. Brother Wesley found his path through the Moravians, so we know that God moves in a mysterious way. I began to preach, I began to pray more. My very first sermon was at age 16, with a chair turned round for my pulpit. And I soon after became a uh, traveling preacher, the willing and humble servant of all, to go far and wide to do good. I had little understanding of just how far and wide that would take me. Whither am I going? To the new world. Well, after ten years as a local preacher, three years in full connection with the Methodist, I thought it about time that I go to conference. I traveled to Bristol, and uh, the thought of America had been on my heart for months before. And Brother Wesley himself spake, Our brethren in America call aloud for help. I found myself as Isaiah, crying out, Here am I, send me. And it was seen that I had a call. And with one or two objections, it was determined that I should go. What to do? First, I had to return home from Bristol to gently acquaint my very tender mother and my father of my great undertaking. They were grieved, of course, but I will say that after some divine assistance, they were convinced to let me go. I returned to Bristol without a penny to my name, and with gracious help from others, I was given money and clothing. And from the port of Pill, I began my journey of over 3,000 miles to the new world. Ah, to gain honor, no if I know my own heart. And in truth, my time on that ship was a model for what I would experience in America, traveling hundreds of miles at a time, no bed to call my own, although we were supposed to bring our own beddings, but we were unfamiliar with this on the ship. And so I spent eight weeks sleeping on the floor with two blankets as my bed. Thankfully, the Methodists in America had proper beds. Along the boat, I also spent my days as here, reading, praying, sometimes preaching to usually well-mannered, sometimes attentive, but often heedless creatures. Even on the windy day when I braced myself against the mizzenmast to help keep myself steady, my sermon bore little fruit. Even with a captive congregation, with water on all sides, the well of souls seemed dry. But though there was also uh, an illness that was to come, in this case nausea, day after day of nausea beyond all human understanding, the ship rolled from side to side, up and down, in a point most disagree. Perhaps there will be no further objection if I refrain from further describing such things. Suffice it to say that if a person wished to gain honor, traveling across the ocean would quickly cool such desires. After eight weeks on the sea, we arrived in the port of Philadelphia, 
and my very heart melted within me when I thought of where we had been and where I was going. Brother Richard Wright and I were directed to Brother Francis Harris's house, where we were entertained and brought to this very building. Richard Pillmore welcomed us and preached. And if there was any honor to be gained, it was in the eyes of those souls who knew not how to express their fervent affection upon our arrival. Because the need was strong for Methodists in America. The, the, the sheep were willing, but the shepherds were wanting. There had been a work of God in America, first by the Quakers, then by the Presbyterians, but they had both declined. I saw the need for Methodists in America, though in truth I doubted my own ability. I was not as pious as I wished to be. My sermons bore feeble testimony. My tongue was thick. I felt as Moses when he said, Oh, my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore nor since thou hast spoken to thy servant. Yet, in Philadelphia, I felt my mind opened to the people, and my heart as well. I found my tongue loosened to speak. The work of God was here, and in God we found all that we need, and there was much needed in America. <laughs> Brothers Pilmore and Boardman seemed rather lax in their enforcement of the rules of our society. They also, and many other preachers from the cities, had very little desire to leave said cities, nor their newfound friends. I, on the other hand, believed that there should be a circulation of preachers, because the frontiers were just in much of need of the gospel as the cities. I believed in a circulation to avoid partiality and popularity. And I believed that it was necessary to do so. To get money. <laughs> I am a Methodist preacher. I do not know why that was ever a concern in my journal. No, in truth, I do know. Many of my fellow Methodists were poor in earthly things, but longing for heavenly reward. But some, as they began to prosper, they took to heart Wesley's admonition to earn all you can, to save all you can, but it was as if they had fallen asleep before he could utter, give all you can. No, I am going to live to God and bring others to do so. There were miles to travel, souls to save, hearts to warm. Many found their faith wanting, their friends and family judging. I doubted my abilities as a preacher, my piety, my potential. Yet I willingly went into the highways and hedges again and again to call all to the heavenly feast. We encountered troubles from without and from within. There were backsliders, naysayers, hypocrites, deserters, but the more trouble that I found myself encountering, the more convinced I was that I was doing the work of God. <sighs> if there was no meeting house, we would meet in a home. If there was no home, we would meet in a field or in the woods. If there was no pulpit, a rock or a table would serve. Wherever two or more were gathered in God's name, there God was in the midst of us. I have completed my mission, traveling annually over 3,000 miles for 45 years. If I were young, I would cheerfully go again. There is a great work that has been done here in America but I dare say that there is a great work, a considerable work still to do. If Methodists now are as Methodists were in my day, they are better hearers than doers. Brethren, help each other in doing good. Live to God and help others to do so. Amen.
And now we'll be blessed with a musical presentation from the Philadelphia United Methodist Mass Choir. Thank you. That was incredibly beautiful. <laughs> um, now it is time for our speaker. Dr. John Wigger is a professor of history at the University of Missouri. His research focuses on American religious and cultural history. A graduate of Fuller Theological Seminary and a two-time graduate of the University of Notre Dame. Dr. Wigger is the author of Taking Heaven by Storm, Methodism and the Rise of Popular Christianity in America, and The Rise and Fall of Jimmy and Temmie Faye Baker's Evangelical Empire. Dr. Wigger, on a personal note, it was your book Taking Heaven by Storm which sparked my interest in Methodist history. It's the first book of Methodist history that I ever read, um, and I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't put it down, and I haven't put down Methodist history since then. But today, we honor your work as Asbury's most contemporary biographer. American Saint Francis Asbury and the Methodists is a phenomenal biography which situates Asbury in the complexity of transatlantic Methodism and revolutionary America and meticulously traces why and how he responded to his call over and over again. Welcome, Dr. Rager. Well, thank you for that very kind introduction. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be with you today and to celebrate this event. 
Um, thank you to Pastor Mark Salvacion for, and the congregation for opening this wonderful historic building. Um, also, thank you to Bishop Scholl and especially to Fred Day, who's been my contact and the person who gross, so graciously invited me to do this. I also didn't expect that I would meet Francis Asbury here today, and that was really wonderful. Um, it is true, Asbury always wore the knee breeches, even as the younger preachers in his charge um, began to uh, uh, take a fancy to the new long pants. <laughs> Francis Asbury had lived a remarkable life, a life that many have admired but few have envied. I've lived with Frank in my head for more than 30 years now, and he still amazes me. During his 45-year career in America, he died in 1816, he never married or owned much more than he could carry on horseback. He led a wanderer's life of voluntary poverty and intense introspection. The church and the nation ultimately disappointed him, but his faith never did. Methodism became the, the religion of 19th century America, and in the 20th century, its offshoot, Pentecostalism, became one of the most influential global religious movements. Francis Asbury is an important reason why all of this happened the way that it did. The son of an English gardener, Asbury was raised in a small village outside of Birmingham, England. He became a metal worker's apprentice at age 13 and began circuit preaching at age 20. He did not come to America until age 26. I have had the privilege of visiting the Asbury Cottage in Great Bar on a couple of occasions, once while on a tour of Asbury Land with my friend David Hallam, who perhaps knows more than anyone about the early history of Methodism in Birmingham. I don't think that John Wesley expected all that much from Asbury when he sent him to America in 1771. He had been a dependable preacher in England, though mostly on hard scrabble circuits without notable success. He was also expendable, which made him the perfect candidate for a mission with pretty dubious prospects. Yet Asbury adapted to the landscape and culture of America with surprising thoroughness and speed. Of John Wesley's licensed missionaries to the colonies, he was the only one who stayed through the American Revolution as a Methodist minister. He developed a remarkably keen sense of what Americans were looking for and how to reach them with the gospel. He traveled at least 130,000 miles by horse and crossed the Allegheny Mountains some 60 times. For many years, he visited nearly every state once a year and traveled more extensively across the American landscape than probably any person of his day. He preached more than 10,000 sermons and ordained probably 2,000 to 3,000 preachers. He was more widely recognized face to face than any person of his generation, including such national figures as Thomas Jefferson and George Washington. Landlords and tavern keepers knew him on sight in every region, and parents named more than a thousand children after him. People called out his name as he passed by on the road. Among other things, his contact with countless people in every region over more than four decades gave him a perhaps unique perspective on that American tragedy, slavery. More about this in a minute. Asbury is seldom remembered as an important American religious leader in part because he did not exert influence in the ways we expect. He was not a charismatic communicator like George Whitfield or Amy Semple McPherson or Oral Roberts or Billy Graham. He was not an intellectual like Jonathan Edwards. Asbury was known for preaching disjointed sermons that were almost impossible to follow and he never published a book of any note. Even after he'd been a bishop for several decades, he rarely spoke at conferences of the preachers for fear that he would embarrass himself. Instead, Asbury communicated his vision for Methodism in four enduring ways. The first was through his life of legendary piety and devotion. People saw in him a dedication to the gospel that they themselves had never managed to attain, but to which, on their better days, they aspired. 
Though he spent his life traveling, he insisted on riding inexpensive horses and using cheap saddles and riding gear. He ate sparingly and usually got up at 4 or 5 a.m. to pray for an hour in the stillness before dawn. Asbury used poverty to keep himself honest. He hoped that it would have the same effect on the church. He gave away nearly all the money that came his way. He deliberately set off on the road without enough money to reach his next appointment, making it obvious to all that he was not hoarding wealth or living a lifestyle that what, above what was available to them. Prior to 1800, all circuit preachers, from first-year probationers to the bishops, were entitled to the same salary, $64 a year. After 1800, it was $80 a year. Asbury insisted on holding to this pattern to prevent money from becoming a primary motive for advancing to more senior positions in the church. The second way Asbury communicated his vision was through his ability to connect with ordinary people. Connection is, of course, an important word for Methodist, and Asbury embodied its meaning better than anyone. As he crisscrossed the nation from year to year, he, he conversed with countless thousands. It is remarkable how many people became permanent friends after a single conversation and his ability to connect with them really stands in stark contrast to his inability to speak in public. There was something genuine and authentic about Asbury that drew others to him. For more than 40 years, he lived as a house guest in other people's homes, usually only staying in each for a few days. Often, he did not have a private room to retire to, for more than 40 years, he lived the most transparent life imaginable. People saw him at unguarded moments, when he was tired, when he got up in the morning, when he was surrounded by conflict, and they liked him the better for it. The closer people got to Asbury, the more they admired him. How many celebrities can you say that about? He could also be funny, which enhanced his appeal. 19th century Methodists did not generally consider joking and laughter compatible with religion. So the number, yeah. So the number of stories relating Asbury's humor, often at his, at his own expense, is surprising. The third conduit of Asbury's vision was the way he understood and used popular culture. John Wesley and Asbury were alike in their willingness to negotiate between competing religious and cultural worlds. Wesley and Asbury came from significantly different backgrounds, but they shared the realization that the dominant religious institutions of their day were failing to reach most people. One could argue that the same is largely true today. All religious movements interact with the prevailing culture of their time and place. To either completely accept or reject the larger culture is to cease to be religious on the one hand or popular on the other. Leaders like Asbury understand this tension and work within it. At times they call their movements to reject the dominant culture. But this rejection can never be complete. Indeed, in ways that these leaders and their followers may never completely acknowledge or understand, the success of their movements hinge on maintaining contact with the culture around them. Asbury did not accept American culture indiscriminately. He was deeply suspicious of much of it and never simply identified the mission of Methodism with that of America. Yet cultural accommodation exacted a price, the clearest example of that of which was slavery, which haunted Asbury for the last 30 years of his life. As long as they were poor, most, most Methodists agreed with Asbury that wealth was a snare. But as Methodists became more prosperous, they became less concerned about the dangers of wealth, much to Asbury's dismay. He rarely used exclamation points in his journal, but when he did, it usually had something to do with the spiritual apathy of rich Methodists. The fourth way that Asbury communicated his vision for Methodism was through his organization of the church. 
He was a brilliant administrator and a keen judge of human motivations. Given the communication technology of the time, his practice of continually riding a circuit from north to south, east to west, encompassing the geographical limits of the church and indeed the nation, provided him with unrivaled knowledge. In his annual tours, he never rode the same circuit twice. It would have been easier to stick to familiar roads, but for Asbury, it was more important to continually expand his horizons, to meet new people and encounter new perspectives. It was the only way to stay connected. No one knew the church or America better. He talked with everyone, everywhere. His conversations with people he met on the road began early in the morning and lasted well into the night, day in and day out. During his first years in America, before the Revolution, he connected with young Methodist preachers in the Upper South, where the movement was growing the fastest. Though Asbury was rarely, if ever, among the shouters and jumpers at Methodist meetings, he quickly accepted the enthusiasm of Southern Methodist worship, which was far more boisterous than anything he had known in England. Asbury rarely shouted when he preached, but he did not object to Southern preachers who thundered forth. His bond with American Methodists, black and white, started here. An incident from early in his career before the American Revolution illustrates both his use of humor and his cultural awareness. Two years after Asbury arrived in America, Wesley sent Thomas Rankin to better enforce discipline something that Rankin was entirely suited to do. Rankin was particularly offended by what he saw as the, quote, wild enthusiasm of Southern Methodist worship, and he was determined to put a stop to it. At a conference of the preachers, Rankin launched into a tirade against, quote, the spirit of the Americans, urging that, quote, a stop must absolutely be put to the prevailing wildfire or it would prove ruinous. Of course, most of the young preachers listening to Rankin were Americans and Southerners who saw nothing wrong with the way their people worshipped. Asbury understood this and decided to intervene on their behalf. As Rankin railed on, Asbury jumped up, pointed across the room, and said, I thought, I thought, I thought, to which an obviously annoyed Thomas Rankin replied, Pray, Mr. Asbury, what did you thought? I thought I saw a mouse, Asbury said. <laughs> the joke must have been perfectly timed because otherwise it, it really isn't that funny. And of course, humor is one of those mul markers of culture that's impossible to, to get right if you don't really understand your audience. But it worked. It, quote, electrified the young preachers according to Thomas Ware, who witnessed the event, and they roared with laughter. It let them know that Asbury understood them and their people. Of course, Thomas Rankin saw it otherwise and never really forgave Asbury for what he saw as a pretty clear insult. Later, Asbury became a proponent of camp meetings, another innovation that Methodists made their own. After attending his first camp meeting by that name in 1802, he immediately began writing letters to his preachers and presiding elders, urging them to adopt this new format. What was clear to Asbury the moment he first set foot on a campground was that they had the potential to expand the reach of the church by creating a new, more open and inviting space that drew in new audiences. Both of these are great examples of Asbury and the church not just mimicking culture, but creating it and pushing it forward. It is much easier to imitate than to create. But when you co-opt culture, it also co-opts you. The clearest example of this in Asbury's time was slavery. During the American Revolution, while he was confined mostly to Delaware, Asbury wrote, quote, I have lately been much impressed with a deep concern for bringing about the freedom of the slaves. I am strongly persuaded that if the Methodists will not yield on this point and emancipate their slaves,
God will depart from them. At the Christmas conference of 1784, in which Asbury was ordained a bishop, he participated in formulating a set of rules that would have eliminated slavery from the church by requiring all Methodist slaveholders to free their slaves. But the new rules only lasted six months, about the time it took for copies of the discipline to reach Charleston and provoke a reaction from white Methodists in the South. From that point on, Asbury tacitly participated in the slowly advancing regional division of Methodism over slavery. He prioritized access to all people in every region over confronting the injustice and depravity of slavery. I wish it had been otherwise. Asbury understood the compromise that he was making. He spent most of his winters in or near Charleston, South Carolina, where he mixed with slaves, free blacks, and pro-slavery whites almost daily. His annual tour usually took him north through Philadelphia or New York and often to New England, where the cultural context was completely different. Over time, Asbury's approach settled into a pattern of doing as much good as he thought he could in each local setting without endangering the unity of the church. Perhaps nowhere was this clearer than in Philadelphia. In 1792, Richard Allen and his fellow black Methodists left St. George after they, were, after they were disrespectfully dragged from their knees while at prayer for having supposedly chose, chosen the wrong seats in this very gallery. At a point when Allen might have left Methodism altogether, Asbury's support played a crucial role in his decision to stay and form an independent black Methodist church. At this point, Allen, a local preacher without a conference appointment, was up against the, the city's leading white Methodists and the Philadelphia presiding elder, John McClaskey, who did not like Allen. To eliminate as much opposition as he could, Asbury reconfigured the leadership of Philadelphia Methodism in Allen's favor. In July 1793, he removed McClaskey, whom he had appointed only the year before, sending him to Baltimore, and replacing him with Freeborn Gerritsen, the very preacher who had first convinced Allen's former master of the injustice of slavery. Gerritsen was Methodism's foremost abolitionist, and it seems unlikely that anyone could have missed the significance of his appointment at this crucial juncture. Gerritsen certainly understood it that way. After he settled in New York six years previous to this in 1788, he only accepted two appointments outside the state under circumstances that seemed of the utmost importance. The first of these was to Philadelphia in 1793. After Gerritsen left Philadelphia the following year, Asbury continued to support Allen by appointing new preachers friendly to black Methodism, including Ezekiel Cooper in 1795 and 1796. In June 1794, Asbury accepted Richard Allen's invitation to preach the dedication sermon at Mother Bethel. Allen's record records that, quote, many heart, hearty amens echoed through the house as Asbury preached. This was typical Asbury, working behind the scenes in small ways, the cumulative effect of which he hoped would make a different difference and build connections. The dilemma that Asbury faced in dealing with increasing prosperity and elitism was eloquently described by another Methodist preacher with Philadelphia connections, Jerina Lee. Lee was converted in part by Joseph Pilmore, one of the first preachers John Wesley sent to America, and attended Richard Allen's Mother Bethel Church here in Philadelphia. When Lee first told Allen that she had been called to preach, he turned her aside, telling her that the Methodist Church did not allow for female preachers. Eight years later, Allen changed his mind after hearing Lee preach an impromptu sermon at Bethel. What followed for Lee was a ministry full of visions, impressions, 
people shouting, shouting and falling to the floor, and other, quote, signs and wonders by which, quote, God's spirit was poured out in miraculous manner. This from her autobiography, published in 1836. Lee preached fearlessly before slaveholders and slaves in the free North and the slave South. During one four-year stretch, she traveled 1,600 miles preaching the gospel, 211 of which she walked on foot. During another year, she traveled more than 2,000 miles and preached 178 sermons. Asbury would have approved. By the time she wrote her autobiography in 1836, Lee understood that many would scoff at the supernaturalism in her account. She saved her final page to answer their objections. Quote, as to the nature of uncommon impressions, which the reader cannot but have noticed and possibly sneered at in the course of these pages, they may be accounted for in this way, wrote Lee. The blind, she observed, have, quote, a sense of feeling that is exceedingly fine and is found to detect any roughness on the smoothest of surface, where those who can see find none. So it may be with such as I am, who has never had more than three months schooling and wishing to know much of the way and law of God, have therefore watched the more closely the operations of the Spirit and have in consequence been led thereby. She could not see because of her lack of education, she wrote, so God gave her the ability to feel for the spirit. This analogy perfectly captures the tension that Asbury sensed two decades earlier. Toward the end of his life, Asbury increasingly felt out of step with the church he had spent his career nurturing. He felt alienated from the sort of Methodist who would form the core of the American middle class as it took shape in the middle of the 19th century. Nor did he have much sympathy for the fancy young preachers who catered to their interest, young men, as Asbury put it, who, quote, we can view in no other light than as men going into the ministry by their learning, sent by their parents, or moved by pride, the love of ease, money, or honor. He disagreed with a prevailing notion, quote, that we cannot now, as in former apostolic days, have such doctrines, such disciplines, such convictions, such conversions, such witnesses of sanctification, and such holy men. I say that we can. I say that we must. Elitism, particularly the sort displayed by wealth, troubled Asbury because of who it excluded. From the vantage point of the early 19th century, he could not see the rise of the American middle class, which took shape beginning in the middle decades of the century and which gave Methodists a solid constituency through the 1950s. Nor could he see the dramatic expansion of the holiness movement and Pentecostalism, which grew mostly from Wesleyan roots and which took Methodism's place on the margins of society as it moved towards the center. So what is Francis Asbury's legacy? I think it is best served, summed up by the word connection. Not a connection built on public charisma, but on what we generally mean by words like character, authenticity, transparency, and engagement. Throughout his 45-year career in America, Asbury did nothing if not build connections. Connections not based on hierarchy or celebrity or money, but on something closer to the gospel, rooted in the bonds of love. Though he was often racked by insecurities, he was loath to give up on any relationship that he thought he could salvage. Everyone had a place in the Methodist connection, and no sacrifice was too great to see that they found it. More broadly, Asbury construed a movement that was adept at connecting faith and culture, specifically John Wesley's theology and American culture as it took shape after the Revolution. Along the way, Asbury inspired a generation of Methodists to think beyond themselves in ways that changed their world. We become the stories that we tell ourselves. We learn from the examples we keep foremost in our thoughts. 
Hasbury's story should be one of these. Thanks. Dr. Wigger, we give thanks and praise for your words, your authenticity that you brought this day, and the gift that you've given us. Thank you. Thank you. There are so many who made today possible, and we just want to share a few words of appreciation to the Asbury Crossing planning team under the direction of Dr. Ashley Bogendreff. We give thanks to the supporting United Methodist General Agencies, the General Commission on Archives and History, the staff and members, United Methodist Communications and Dan Krauss, to the Eastern Pennsylvania Commission on Archives and History and the Historical Society, Reverend Mark Young, Reverend Mark Salvacion, Reverend Joe DiPaolo, we give thanks. To the Greater New Jersey Annual Conference, our partner in ministry, we give thanks and praise. To the Historical Society of the United Methodist Church and Ivan Corbin, we give thanks. To the Philadelphia United Methodist Mass Choir, thank you for blessing us this day with the gift of music. And we give thanks um, as well to my very first district superintendent who welcomed me here in Eastern Pennsylvania to the Reverend Dr. Fred Day and all of his effort. Will you thank me? Join me in thanking him. This day, if you feel led to help underwrite this program, we welcome you to do so. As you uh, depart this day, there will be baskets that will greet you. If you would like to make a check out, you are welcome to make that payable to EPA UMC Memo Line Asbury Crossing. We rejoice in the gift of this day. We pray that you'll join us tomorrow for worship at 10 a.m. And we welcome back the Philadelphia United Methodist Mass Choir as they lead us in song.
Asbury famously wrote in his journal, as we've heard a couple of times today, whither am I going to the new world? What to do? To gain honor? No. To get money? No. I am going to live to God and to bring others to do so. May we all do our best to embody this call of God, to live in to God's love and to bring others to do so. For that is the heart of Methodism. Go and love. We'll see you tomorrow.